Thank you for having me here. Um, so my name is Kostas, some of the E and CS departments. Um, this talk is about what well, the title says, efficient routing and vehicular networks. And um, I guess that the crowd is quite uh, interdisciplinary here. Uh, so I will try to please everybody, but uh, please ask questions and slow me down because basically there are some guys with E engineering background and I have some slides with some analysis. Maybe there are some guys from planning background they need more information about vehicular networks and fundamentals about how the system is work and what it does is working and how and what it does so please uh, participate actively in order for me to properly pace the talk okay so thanks a lot again and uh, let's start with um, what the, how the future internet looks which uh, for us is the infrastructure and when I'm saying internet it's really basically the collection of all the networks that they are out in the world right now so uh, everybody agrees that uh, oops, um, at the core of the internet we will have wires which is the case indeed and the edges of the internet will be uh, primarily if not exclusively wireless now, you could think of uh, many type, types of edges around this wired core, um, wireless edges, and there are two fundamentally different uh, uh, paradigms. One is what I call single hop and the other what I call multi hop. So single hop is when you connect directly to a base station wirelessly, but the base station is connected to the rest of the internet with a wire. So this is what you do when you use your laptops because you connect to an access point at USB wireless. Uh, this is what we do when we use our smartphones uh, for data plans because we connect directly to the cell towers. And then the cell towers are connected to the rest of the network. But then there is also this uh, other paradigm of multi-hopping, <coughs> wireless multi-hopping, where the wireless path is longer than a single hop. And uh, you could think of cases where I am connecting to an access point, but the access point is connecting to another access point, and the other access point is connected to some other access point, which is eventually connected to the wired mm -hmm. network. Now, if you think about like a vehicular network, you could be driving a car, and perhaps there is no roadside unit base station close by, but there are other cars close by, so you are connecting to some other cars, the other cars are serving as relays, and then these other cars perhaps are closer to a base station or an access point, and they are connected to this uh, core wired network. So I'm just showing here like 3G, 4G, you all know what this means. Uh, and Wi-Fi is what you use with your laptops. Um, the mesh and the mobile ad hoc and the sensor cases here are really multi-hop uh, uh, cases. And clearly, if we, are, we will be talking about vehicular networks, we are really mobile. Whether we are ad hoc or not, this uh, remains to be seen in the future. But definitely, some vehicular networks will have an ad hoc flavor on them. So, okay, so our application, as I said, is uh, vehicular networks. Here is a picture, I'm sure you have seen many, many pictures like that over the last five years or so, where basically, in this particular picture, supposedly there is an accident happening or some police car, whatever, intercepting another car. And you can see that there are multi-hopping paths because, for example, uh, here this vehicle is talking to that vehicle. So there is this inter-vehicle communication and then this guy, which is, by the way, uh, you know, fire, car, whatever, it's actually talking to the pole where the pole supposedly is connected in a wide fashion to the rest of the network. So this is a case of a multi hopping uh, communication. But then there are, if you only, for example, uh, look at this uh, ambulance here that is talking directly to the pole, to this roadside base station, this is uh, a vehicle to roadside communication case and it's single hopping. So as I said, the technologies we should be considering in order to make this happen are both single hop and multi hop. And the key is to be able to seamlessly use all technologies. Because if we say, you know, it's fine, I'm going to have some uh, 3G or 4G <coughs> card on some specialized box inside every car, and I'm going to be using the data network, then there are problems like very high cost, or maybe sometimes if you're in a mountainous road, maybe there is no coverage anyway, like cell phone coverage. 
if you say I'm going to be using multi-hop technologies only, the problem is that it tends, they tend to have less performance uh, because there is more interference there. So basically, you need to have a suite of technologies available and be able to use them at the same time. So well, let me use this one. Why? Well, I started already talking about this, but let me be a little bit more detailed about why we also want the multi-hopping uh, capability on this uh, vehicular network system. Uh, in the sense, because you already you are already using single hopping uh, wireless in your everyday life, so you already know why how we use it and why we need it. So. Why do we need, let's say, to have what I call here mess networks? Mess networks is the case where you have static <coughs> base stations that they are talking to each other, not through a cable, but through a wire. So you can think of this uh, uh, example here. Imagine you are uh, in the center of a city and you have uh, lamp poles. So it's, you have power because you have the lights. You can put base stations there. <coughs> But then, in order to connect them with a the wire, it's a big cost because you have to run cables, you have to start you know, breaking pavements and stuff like that. Instead of that, you might as well just connect these guys wirelessly as well. So the car would talk to a lamp pole, you know, and the lamp pole is going to talk to another lamp pole and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Why would we need mobile ad hoc? Well, as I explained before, um, there are cases where if you're sitting in a vehicle and you don't have direct communication to a roadside uh, a base station. For example, imagine you're sitting in a, a car in a big city, there's a traffic light, and there's like a big line. You could say, well, perhaps the city is going to decide to put uh, base stations, roadside units, in every traffic light. But if intersections are far apart, you don't have uh, enough power to talk with a traffic light. But there are all these cars sitting idle in front of you. You know, let's say you are the 20th or the 30th car in the line, you can talk to the car, you know, like the 15th car and so on and so forth. So you do this multi-hopping. And then I also want to mention and stress this intermittently connected case. First of all, what is the intermittently connected case? It's the case where you don't even have a path, a contemporaneous end-to-end -end path to a roadside base station. Why would that be the case? Well, because it's not really economically feasible to completely cover the complete geographical space that you are interested in. I mean, maybe in the future somebody will do it, but I don't see it happening uh, soon enough. Uh, for example, would we cover the whole California land? No, we wouldn't. Uh, not even all the whole California you know, driving uh, system, you know, like highway system and so on and so forth. So for this reason, every now and then, you simply don't have a path, either a single hop or multi hop. What do you do? Do you say, I'm sorry, the system is not working anymore? No, the idea is you can basically offer a cost, of, a cost effective way of full coverage. It's not really full coverage in, uh, in, the, in the contemporaneous sense. The idea is, well, you could potentially um, give your packets to other cars. The cars are moving as well. So at some point, uh, some of all these cars that they have your own packets will reach a roadside base station and they will be able to forward your packets. So you get more delays, higher delays there, but you do get some connectivity. And sometimes it's important. I'll show you some uh, scenarios here. Uh, one very popular scenario is when you are uh, driving in a mountain road and there is an accident and clearly you're not going to have coverage in all you know, the small mountain uh, roads. But you know, there is an accident and there is a car moving, let's say, on the other direction of the accident. So maybe you can inform this car and this car is, is, is driving towards this village. And maybe the village has a roadside uh, base station. Okay? Um, now, what are the challenges? The challenges are all over the place. These are networking layer challenges. And I know that some of you uh, do not work in networking. Uh, but let me try to explain what I'm uh, saying here. There are challenges in the application layer. Application layer is like the layer where your email sits. Uh, because we need to be able to select uh, the particular networking technology we want to use, given the network conditions and the, what I say here, user cost-benefit preferences. What I mean by that is, even if you have 3G or 4G, it tends to be expensive. If you have a Wi-Fi connection, it's <coughs> higher bandwidth and it's cheaper. So naturally, people would prefer to use that if it's available. Already smartphones like let's say iPhones, they have applications where they say to you, 
do you really want to send your emails immediately or is it okay if you wait for up to half an hour or an hour such that if I come within range of a Wi-Fi base station, I will just send all your emails then instead of sending them right now through my your 3G data plan and people are using it. So transport layer, there are challenges there as well because the end-to-end -end behavior of this connection between, let's say, the vehicle and whatever your destination is, I mean the destination of your packets, depends on the mode of operation of the network. If, for example, we have intermittent connectivity, uh, it doesn't really make sense to have uh, acknowledgments. End-to-end -end acknowledgments is what uh, net networks use all the time to kind of notify the sources that, yeah, your packets have arrived uh, successfully, but then how can you really do this if there isn't even a contemporaneous end-to-end -end path. You know, you're going to send your packet through some path, but then when the acknowledgement will be, will be ready to be sent to you, this path is not going to be alive anymore anyway. Um, then there are significant uh, challenges in the routing layer. Routing layer is how you actually do route packets. And you can clearly see that traditional routing approaches where you say, I know how the network looks like. So I have some routing tables, and I'm saying if you want to go there, you have to go this way and follow these particular links. Clearly, it will fall apart in the case of a mobile network where links change all the time. Or even worse, sometimes simply there aren't any links available right now, and you have to wait for a link to become alive. Um, last, there are even challenges at lower layers, like the link layer. Um, because you need to be able to change uh, between these uh, different technologies in a seamless fashion. Uh, even uh, use these multiple technologies at the same time. You know, perhaps you want to download a movie, I don't know, for your kids sitting at the back of the car, and you want to really get it as fast as possible. So you're willing to use your 3G, 4G, use Wi-Fi as you're driving, just use whatever you can to just get this thing as fast as possible. So. From all these things, I'm going to really focus on the routing. I mean, the title says uh, efficient routing. Uh, on the routing layer, oops, and in particular, on uh, the most interesting and new things around, which are the multi-hopping and the intermittent connectivity characteristics of routing. Uh, because um, for those of you that you are EE or CS students, and uh, you know about networking maths, routing has been solved. Uh, not in the multi-hopping and the internet of the case, but in you know, the usual case, this is how internet is working. This is how we get to route all our packets whenever we're sending emails or doing web browsing. But in this particular case, it hasn't. So this is why it's uh, of interest to the research community. OK. So If we assume now that we are trying to build a network, a vehicular network, where because cars move around, you get links going down, sometimes you don't have links, you have multi-hopping paths, you have intermittent connectivity, the first thing you would do is you would say, well, let's look at traditional multi-hop routing, which is the first thing that people thought about. They said, okay, let's just use ideas that we have been using for the last two, three decades to do routing in the common case, and let's try to apply them in um, um, this new multi-hopping intermittently connected case. Well, the first problem with that is intermittent connectivity. If you look at that, suppose this is like some <coughs> nodes, cars, that they are kind of connected because they're close to each other. But then there are these connections. It's not that this guy S can talk to this guy D. There is no path right now. Uh, what do you do with traditional ways of routing? Well, you can do it. And, uh, and if you think of... Uh, classic paradigms where this idea of multi-hopping, mobile multi-hopping makes sense, the most, per well, I, I think the most important of which is vehicular, and at least civilian applications, this is probably the most important. Then you have some disaster communication, which is also related because you would have to bring in some vehicles, etc., to bridge connect connectivity gaps and be able to send information, assuming, let's say, the, the cell network is down. Uh, all the way to some uh, non-civilian applications, like ad hoc military networks and so on. In all these cases, you do have contemporaneous, uh, you do have intermittent connectivity. And even if you can uh, establish a path, this path will break maybe 30 seconds in the future. It does, it's not going to long live enough. Uh, it's not going to live long enough. So neither uh, proactive routing or reactive routing will work. These are the standard ways that people used to do routing in the past. 
uh, proactive routing, which is like the internet says, I'm going to proactively create paths for everybody. Reactive routing says, well, you know what? If things change, perhaps don't proactively do things. But once you need to establish a path, figure out a way to find the path and use it from then on. Uh, the other problem uh, with uh, uh, trying to use traditional methods of routing is the high cost for low performance. So how would you be able to use standard routing techniques? What would you have to do? You would have to have a very dense network. Uh, speaking of, uh, let's say, a city, you would have to have base stations pretty much everywhere, such that there are always enough links between any vehicle and any end destination. Everybody is always connected. Well, the problem is that if you do this, if I mean, now I'm going to just go through a well-known uh, uh, result in, in, in network theory. If you do this and you use, let's say, uh, many, many such base stations, suppose you have or many cars around that they are all capable of, of sending packets and relaying packets of other cars. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a unit disk like that, and you have um, static nodes. I'm not going to even make them mobile for now. You can even make them mobile, the same thing works. If you want to have full connectivity, that is, everybody can reach everybody else through some path that exists right now, then the transmission range of your radio has to have a particular uh, minimum uh, capability, and this turns out to be 1 over square root of m, where m is the number of nodes. Otherwise, you simply don't get full connectivity in this graph. Well, if you do this, then you can actually show that the path length, which is clearly the distance between two random pairs, source destination, and your transmission range, has to be at least square root of m. OK? So this is the number of hops. Well, if you take this into consideration, this means that the ratio of a node's own traffic versus the relaying traffic is order of 1 over square root of m. So this means that I am a car or a node, and I'm spending the vast majority of my time and my resources relaying packets of other guys. This could be OK if you are some uh, huge router. It is OK. If you are a huge router sitting in the middle of the core of the internet, this is your job, to relay packets. But if you are a person at the edge of the network and you are itself a user of the network, why should you spend like almost all of your resources and time to relay other people's packets? At the end of the day, this would imply that the good put of the network is going to be very, very low. Because the vast majority of network resources at the edge are being utilized just to move things around, not really to deliver things to the destination. So not only it can't solve the intermittently connected problem, but it's also too costly and has low performance, meaning if you choose to use older methods to do routing. So this is where uh, um, the idea of mobility-assisted routing comes into play, and it is clearly uh, well suited for vehicular networks, which are by definition mobile. Well, the idea is, you know what? If you really want to deal with intermittent connectivity and you want to reduce the number of relays, you might want to consider storing some packets for some time, carry them together with you as you are moving, and then forwarding them. Um, and this is what uh, we are doing. Now, this might be reminiscent of very old ideas. For example, the post office. And it is reminiscent of the post office. And it turns out, to the surprise of the networking community 10 years ago, that it makes sense in some applications. Um, clearly, it, it involves larger delays than usual. But well, if that's your only option, even larger delays are good enough. Or if you're not willing to pay the extra cost to just have full coverage all over the place. Now, there are three cases uh, of mobility-assisted routing uh, that have been um, considered with fundamentally different characteristics. The first case is when you will assume that connectivity opportunities are known in advance. That's really the case for interplanetary networks and satellites. So the idea is you do know how satellites orbit around, and you do know when the links are going to kind of become alive. So you, this way, you kind of plan ahead what you're going to do with uh, your traffic. The second case is, well, you can actually control node mobility to enforce connectivity. This means. You will bring additional resources in order to be able to have connectivity. Think about like a media uh, channel or something. You know, they have these vans and they drive into the incident and they have this big antenna. So this is like you do this just to have connectivity. 
uh, the, the military the military application is really the case for that you know they bring all these UAVs planes whatever you, you bring satellites whatever they need to do in order to establish connectivity and then there is a case where you can't really say that you will do these things you either know really how uh, the connectivity opportunities will play in the future nor are you willing to spend you know the resources to enforce connectivity and this is really the case for vehicles I mean Clearly, in all the vehicle, uh, vehicular applications, you have some infrastructure. It fully covers some areas, but it doesn't some other areas. And you neither know how cars are going to drive around and where they will go in advance, neither do you have any way of uh, I mean, you know, enforcing connectivity. So we will focus on this um, in the rest of the talk. And now, after all this. Uh, um, introduction, I'm going to just give you an example to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about and then I'm going to just talk about, uh, I'm going to give you the outline of the rest of the talk. So what are we talking about here? <coughs> Suppose I want to send <coughs> this packet to the destination D. Well, I could initially just forward it directly to some uh, other car, assuming there is no uh, base station around, but then this car is going to drive to the next traffic light. Then in the next traffic, oh, that was too fast, I think. I don't know why. Well, let me try once more. OK, so then this the car is going to move to the next traffic light, and it's going to forward you know, the packet into another car, which is going to move to the next traffic light. And the next traffic light has a <coughs> base station, uh, like a roadside unit. So here, the, the, then you get into the wired core, and the packet is delivered to the destination. This is what we're talking about, okay? Which is, for those of you that you know some things about networking, this is extremely different from the traditional networking paradigm. For those of you that don't, it doesn't matter. This is the example that. <laughs> this is the, because, you know, that's what we'll study, okay? So, of course, yes. Yeah. So, um, so does this mean that the speed of transmitting that packet is only as good as the speed of hopping across all the all the vehicles yes. and the speed at which they're traveling. Yes, okay. it, it does mean that. That's why I said there will be large delays. Okay. Uh, and that's why if you do have a way to send it directly, by all means, send it. But <coughs> sometimes, simply you don't. And there are also some applications related to vehicular networks that these speeds don't matter that much. For example, suppose you're driving on a highway, and there is an accident on one side of the highway. So now the cars involved in the accident are transmitting messages that the cars driving on the other direction are getting. Now these cars are driving, let's say, 60 miles an hour the other direction. They will notify all the cars that they are approaching the accident in time for them to slow down, even to start using alternative routes within a matter of, I don't know, 10 seconds, which is good enough for our time, you know, concerns. So, but yes, that's the case indeed. Yes? And you also heard the term self-healing networks, uh -huh. where there's a break in the, in the network itself, and there's some awareness of that break, and then mm -hmm. it will reconfigure itself? Yes. So these, um, the difference with this uh, scenario is that there is an implicit assumption in the scenario you are describing that the network will be able to heal itself and be again fully connected. Fully connected meaning be again able to offer you a path to your destination, a contemporaneous path. I mean, there has to be a path, but you're talking about a contemporaneous path. Here I'm saying that sometimes simply the density of the network and the intense mobility <laughs> and unpredictability of the mobility of the nodes is such that you will not always be able to provide the source with a contemporaneous path to the destination. No matter which connections you attempt to create. Yes, don't yes, exactly. <coughs> Yes? By the way, are the models for <coughs> infectious disease of any use? Yes, that's a good point. And they are of use uh, when you're trying to model um, the delay of such a network. And the first thing that people attempted to do, and I will talk about this in two or three slides, is basically, a, we call it epidemic routing, coming right, from epidemics, see. because you basically just flood the network with whatever you want to send, and you know it takes some time for everybody to get it. Uh, I will talk later about why this thing turned out not to be that uh, efficient and what we had to do to fix no, the problem. Yeah. Yes? 
Yeah, this original diagram. How do these original little networks form? Like, does each car try to talk to every single car? So this, group? yeah. So so this only means that these guys are within range of each other. So assume that the box. So how? Uh, let me ask you this. Um, when your laptop finds a base station, you as a user have no idea about this. What really happens is that the wireless internet base stations, you know, like USB wireless, are sending some beacons, and your radio is receiving these beacons, and, and, and your laptop hence knows of the existence of this. So the same thing is going to happen there. You know, the cars will be having these boxes that essentially will have exactly the same technology, and they will be aware that there are all these other cars around. That's how it's going to work. OK, so let me move on with the outline. All this was an introduction to make sure that everybody understands what we'll be talking about. You know, if the crowd is so diverse, you need to go like that. Otherwise, they won't. So design, the first thing I'm going to talk about is how you design efficient routing schemes in this example, in this case, in this scenario. Uh, the second thing, I'm going to show you some theory. I don't know how much you are into theory. So I will most likely, well, depending on the feedback, I will skip some proofs or some analysis. I don't have any heavy proofs. I have some simple ideas there um, uh, about how we deal with mobility, with wireless contention, this is interference, how we apply the theory to protocol design. Because at the end of the day, you don't do the theory just for the theory. You need to design a system that is efficient. And uh, finally, I will talk about something that is of interest uh, in practice, which is how you classify networks. And what I mean by that is the following. If you are into, if you are operating in an environment where the network is so dynamic, you need to figure out how connected the network is because this is going to affect significantly what type of protocols you will use and what type, what kind of parameters you will use in your protocols. For example, are you in a vehicular network in the center of a city that it's fully, almost fully connected? Or are you in uh, an area of the city or in some suburbs where connectivity is not really Good. You need to have a way, you as a node, as a car, to figure this out somehow by just observing what's happening around you and choose the right protocols. Okay. So I will talk about that as well. So flooding, uh, as uh, being suggested about epidemics, what flooding does and why it doesn't work. So the idea is that just nodes exchange uh, packets with all their neighbors. And this way, you flood uh, the network with your packets. Uh, the problem is, well, waste of resources, but we knew that already, right? It's pretty obvious. But it's just as that. Interestingly enough, flooding, because it creates severe contention, it leads to low performance, even in sparse networks. So let me just uh, say some more things here, because for those of you that you don't, you are not familiar with wireless networking. Whenever you send something, in the vast majority of cases today, like 99.99%, you only directionally send this around you with the same power, which means everybody around you is going to overhear it. It's like you are in a room and you, know, you speak and everybody's listening to your voice. So what happens in wireless networking is that when I want to send something to somebody and somebody else wants to send something to somebody else, we will collide. It's like having two conversations at the same time in a single room. And this is clearly a problem because now your receiver will not be able to to understand what was intended for you because the receiver will receive both signals at the same time. So this is a very big problem in wireless communications. And uh, there has been a huge effort from many, many different communities, from communication theory all the way to networks, to figure out how to deal with this. And this is what I mean here with severe contention. The moment you choose to flood the network, it means that every single node that has a packet to send it will send it to all its neighbors, and all its neighbors will send it to all their neighbors, and so on and so forth. So now pretty much everybody will be trying to send packets. Yes? You know, uh, a similar problem happens in a room with everybody talking, mm -hmm. and you're trying to hear what someone's And there's something called a cocktail party effect, you know, right. uh, which says that, you know, even though everybody's talking, you really can understand your neighbor. Yes. And I have a feeling, I don't know, does that give you any ideas of what to do? Yeah, so yeah, that's a, a, a good analogy. So the problem is that radios are not as smart as human brains right. yet. 
So their filtering mechanisms right. are not equally advanced, let me put it this way. Yeah. So what people try to do is they try to use different frequencies. Uh, they try to slot the time. So you are talking now and the other guy is talking now and the other guy is talking yeah, now. Yeah. Or you use different codes. I mean, there are all kinds of tricks that we are trying to do. But when we are talking about simple systems that they will be implemented, let's say, like the Wi-Fi system that everybody is using when you're connecting through your laptop, you usually have the same frequency. Uh, <laughs> and at the end of the day, you end up having collisions, which is basically so the situation. Uh, no, I mean, you could have a very expensive radio that would be as smart mm -hmm. as our brain and would filter out. Yeah. But then it's going to be too expensive, so nobody is yeah. going to buy it. But there are such radios for very expensive uh, and important applications. I mean, okay. yeah, Fine. for example. Um, yeah, but they cost like 10,000, just a single radio. You know, when you buy like a 12,000 car, you're not going to spend 10,000 to put a radio like that. So you will spend 50 bucks, like how much you spend for your base station at home, right? Uh, for your wireless network at home. And these radios cannot do this. So, okay, there have been attempts to reduce redundancy why should you send everything to everybody? You know, you can't be smarter than that. You can't just go, you know, all the way. But uh, they turn out that they suffer from the same shortcomings. And the way to deal with this is basically what uh, we call <coughs> spraying-based routing. The idea is redundant copies reduce delay. Too much redundancy, though, is wasteful and often disastrous. So why don't we go for the middle ground? OK, we need some redundancy in the network. If you think about it, flooding means I'm going to just flood everybody with my packets. Well, maybe give your packets to a couple of other guys. You know, don't just try to do it with a single copy all the way. Maybe have three or four or five parallel paths trying to reach your destination instead of having a single path. But don't overdo it. Makes sense. Uh, and there are a bunch of ways of doing this. Now, for those of you that you are EECS students and you want to check papers, whenever I'm referring to papers that we have worked on, I'm going to just you know, put it right like that. And I will only give dates for journal papers. So, so the, the simplest possible way of doing it is with uh, this, I call this spray and wait, which basically says, okay, you are the source, just spray a number of copies in the network, and then these relays will just wait till they find the destination. You would do this to really reduce significantly uh, the amount of resources you need to use, because you don't have many transmissions in this case. You are really waiting till you reach the destination. But then this is going to have delays, so you can do better than that clearly. Uh, so for example, you can spray some uh, message copies to a number of distinct relays, that is a number of distinct cars. And then you will further allow these copies to be routed towards the destination in a hop by hop fashion, maybe changing cars, going through base stations, and so on and so forth. And this is what the spray and focus thing says. So the second phase, instead of just waiting, it's a phase where each of these L copies are trying to carefully pick their next hop to find the destination as fast as possible. And now the natural question is, how do you pick your next hop? What is a good car to forward your packet to your eventual destination? And how do you figure this out? So there are many things that you can use. Speaking of mobile nodes like cars, you have a Things like um, speed, direction of movement, many cars have GPSs. Uh, setting aside privacy issues, perhaps you have programmed your GPS and you actually say, I'm going you know, to my friend whose address is that. And you pretty much know already what this guy, which particular routes this guy is going to use. So if you use all this information, you can actually guess in a pretty uh, successful manner whether you should forward a packet to this car or to that car. Um, and that's what we do. So you can set, you can talk about some utility function, which is the utility of a particular car in delivering a packet into the destination and use you know, the car that maximizes the utility. And this is what we did. Uh, there are some other issues that I'm not going to get into now, perhaps a bit too technical. Now, there are many issues. How many copies should one use? Meaning, what's the level of redundancy that you should use? Uh, yeah, we said we shouldn't let flood the network, but should you use like two copies, three copies, ten copies? Who knows? Uh, how should they be distributed? We already discussed a little bit about this. How should each copy be routed? Again, we already discussed about this. And then there are performance-related issues. Are we going to be better or worse than flooding? 
I mean, yeah, we will, lose, we will use significantly less resources, but what about delays? You know, naturally, if you flood the network, you will really get a minimum delay. If you don't flood the network, I don't know, perhaps you're going to lose some good opportunities because you don't have enough copies floating around. Uh, are we going to be close to optimal? Do we scale? So things like that that tend to um, um, worry engineers a lot. And we address these issues with both simulations and analysis. Um, I will probably skip the analysis. We'll see. Let's start with the simulations first. OK, so what is this scenario here? So I have 100 nodes. They are mobile nodes with a particular mobility model. I'm not going to get into that for now. Just assume that this is a reasonably accurate mobility model, but it's not very, very accurate. It's not that I have like city maps and things are moving like cars, but it's OK. It's a reasonable mobility model. I have some space where these guys are moving. Uh, the radios have some transmission range, so you know in how many cars can be uh, clo uh, within range of you at any point in time. And then on this y-axis, I'm showing the total transmissions required to deliver some packets uh, as a function of the load. So increasing traffic or increasing load means simply that the sources have more packets to deliver uh, to destinations as we go from left to right. And I'm showing here uh, how many total transmissions various flooding-based mechanisms require and spraying-based mechanisms require. And you can see that, as expected, you require significantly less network resources if you are not overdoing it. You say, yeah, I expected that. Come on. But the problem is, what is going to happen with delays? Perhaps the flooding guys would have significantly less delays because they pretty much investigate all the possible paths to the destination. Well, it turns out that the answer is no. Um, you actually do quite well with delays. Sometimes you actually do uh, less. You have sm smaller delays if you spray only a few copies rather than spraying plenty of copies or flood the network because you have significantly less wireless interference, which is what we discussed like five minutes ago. And hence, you have significantly less collisions, less retransmissions, because if your packets collide, you have to send them again, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm going to show you another plot here where I'm varying the connectivity of the network. So the left plot is again about transmissions per successful delivery. The right plot is again about delay. Um, these schemes, epidemic, random flooding, tilt flooding, are all flooding based. These two schemes are spraying based. The same thing here. Uh, as before and as expected, these three schemes spend significantly more resources to deliver <coughs> the same uh, packets, like orders of magnitude more resources. And interestingly enough, as uh, we discussed before, they also have significantly larger delay. Now, these bars here represent different connectivity levels. And the connectivity levels um, depend on uh, your transmission range. This is how I do it. I change the transmission range of the radios. But you shouldn't really focus on that. You should focus on this number, because this number is more intuitive. This number here shows the percentile of nodes that they belong to the maximum connected cluster. So if, let's say, you are at the city center and there are many, many traffic lights and there are a lot of congestion and a lot of cars around there, perhaps, let's say, 80% of your cars are connected, are fully connected. But you could be in uh, farmland and uh, only, let's say, 10% of the cars are fully connected and the rest of the guys are far away. So I'm varying this uh, uh, connectivity percentile. And as you can see, interestingly enough, the more you get connected, actually, the larger the delivery delay of these flooding schemes. Because contention and interference becomes so severe that it simply doesn't work. OK, so I've just said all these things. There is also a last scenario, uh, but it's OK. Um, all I'm going to say here is that there are other things that you need to consider like the fact that you can have very slow and restricted <coughs> mobility, depending on how much congestion you have, and so on and so forth. So all these things serve as um, motivation for us to further research how good these spraying-based schemes are, not just in a, a couple of uh, examples, but in general, in any scenario. And for this reason, um, we will do some performance analysis. Now, as I said, I'm not going to. So how many of you do not have EE background. OK. So I will not get into, I don't know if like school of planning, do you do probability and maths and stuff like that? To some extent, yeah. 
Ah, to some extent, okay. I don't know if you are interested in this or not. You are going to tell me yes. <laughs> uh, so um, I'll just give you the big idea, and I'll just not show you any formulas. Yes? I just wanted to know, so do you, do you give the message that uh, connectivity is bad? Like no, I'm not giving this message. I'm giving the following message, that flooding is bad. In the context of an edge network, which is wireless, choosing to flood the network in order to deliver your packets is really bad. That's the message I'm giving. But in the previous graph, you mm -hmm. were taking this uh, thing like uh, what you call the clustering thing. Yes. Like if you're in a city center, then there are lots of uh -huh. nodes and stuff. So uh, I mean maybe, uh, yeah, so basically you said Here. that since there's more interference, then there are more collisions uh -huh. and more transmission. Uh -huh. So I was wondering that's probably, you can say, like a scenario of very high connectivity. Yeah, but I would say then that if you are in the city center, just you know, do use common sense, put enough base stations so that you don't even have to do multi-hopping. I mean, in downtown LA, if I, you know, if I decide to spend some money to do this in Los Angeles area, metropol I, I would, downtown LA, I would definitely make it fully connected so that cars talk single hop to a lamp pole. It doesn't make sense not to do it. It's high density, right? Um, okay, so. Let's go back here. Um, so, yes? Is traffic problem si uh, similar to the flooding um, scenario? Traffic problem meaning? Meaning congestion from cars. What uh, do you mean? You, you just make that example. I'm sorry? You just make that example about uh, city center traffic. So uh, let me, let me uh, to understand. When you refer to traffic, you mean uh, communication car. networks or car traffic? Car. OK. So, and what do you mean whether it's the same? So what I could say is that there are a lot of analogies between uh, communication network congestion and uh, road network congestion. And there are a lot of ideas that you could take from one field and apply to the other and vice versa. And people have been doing this over the years, for many years now. So there are, clearly, there are similarities. You have some resources, you know, and, and uh, but... So is that Well, I, I think your question is a little bit too general. I don't think you have nailed it down exactly. So maybe we should uh, talk offline to see exactly what you have in mind. Because uh, what I'm showing with uh, these plots is, uh, well, you don't see the plots right now. <laughs> but what I'm showing with the plots is um, in this context when you are trying to deliver things in a flooding scenario, and flooding, you don't get flooding with cars. I mean. I mean, if you think about it, you have some packets that you need to deliver, and you flood cars with the packets. You can't argue the same thing with, I don't know, like having, I don't know, people that you want to transport, and you send them from one car to the other. <laughs> you wouldn't do it. So you cannot draw a parallel in this case with these plots, I guess. Um, OK, going back to how you analyze the performance of the systems, what you fundamentally want to do is you want to compute the expected delivery delay, because this is what matters to users most. Now, uh, clearly, uh, this analysis is going to depend on the mobility models considered. Let me have a, uh, some short discussion about that, because I think that's of interest to you uh, to a large extent. So the EECS engineering community started utilizing some uh, mobility models that they were totally unrealistic, like random walks. Do you know what random walk is, right? You move up, down, left, or right with the same probability, and you just move like that. I mean, no car would ever move like that. Random waypoint and random direction has like similar ideas. Then there were some community-based models that we introduced in order to basically solve this problem, meaning we wanted to have realistic mobility models, but at the same time to be able to analyze the performance of the systems. So we had to keep some structure there to be able to do some math. Um, and of course, there are various simulators that perhaps you know already uh, that they generate city-style uh, traces of how cars move. I don't know if you're aware of this and you're using them. Um, so um, prior work on, uh, analyti on analysis and analytical performance of this system had a completely different focus. In my opinion, it wasn't particularly uh, useful in practice. It was interesting uh, as an exercise. But it has asymptotic uh, results. I don't know how many of you are aware of asymptotic results. Essentially, you get results as the number of cars goes to infinity. You know? So it's nice mathematically, but it doesn't really mean much in practice. And they also considered 
fundamentally only connected networks. And personally, I don't think that it made sense. The networking community spent like five years of effort analyzing uh, fully connected mobile ad hoc networks, which I just don't see the point. If you're going to be so dense to be fully connected, just put base stations and have single hop connections. Everybody will directly talk to a base station and make the, your life simpler, less money, better performance. Why would you do this ad hoc thing if everybody can talk to everybody else all the time? So anyway, uh, that's the only, I guess, um, slide I'm going to talk about uh, with respect to analysis. I apologize for those of you that you really wanted to hear about the analysis, but you should come to me at the end of the um, talk, and I will say more, and I will point to the papers that you should read. Uh, there are many papers, as you can see, in transactions on networking and transaction mobile computing. So the fundamental pieces of the analysis consist of the following three things. The first thing is we need to compute the node and counter times. That is, how much time it takes for a car to meet another car. Because sending da data over the air is a lot faster than moving cars around. So the fundamental delay here is going to come by how much time it takes for the cars to meet. Uh, these are called heating and meeting times of corresponding processes. Those of you that you are into probability, uh, not just first level probability, I see some guys, but maybe a more advanced probability courses, you would know what this thing means. And there are ways we can work this out. Uh, then we need to deal with the fact that we have multiple copies. This complicates the analysis because now when you're trying to figure out what's the delay, not only you need to figure out how much time it takes for two guys to meet, but you also have to keep in mind that there are multiple copies trying to find the destination, so you have to figure out what is the copy that will reach the destination faster than the rest of the copies? So, yes? Um, this may be a really dumb question. But there are we, no dumb we questions. We have traffic simulation models uh -huh. that can simulate vehicles moving on a network. Uh huh. Okay? And with one of those models, you know the headways, you know the number of times, you know, you could actually figure out how often do they. Um, encounter each other going in opposite directions, mm -hmm. how many, you know, how often do they mm -hmm. encounter each other going in cross directions, uh, and so on and so forth, just by virtue of the geometry of the network and the flows on the network. Mm -hmm. So if you did that, would that help what you're doing here? So if you did that, it would help in the following manner, and it is actually what you're asking me is directly related to step two, which is where I am now, so it was a very good timing. <laughs> It would help in giving you an idea about the distribution of uh, these uh, encounter times. So you would say, but then the point is, once you have the distributions from real traces, you still need to work out the formulas, because this is our end goal here. We need to come up with formulas saying expected delay equals and then you will have this as a function of the number of cars you have, transmission ranges, all the things that you can come up, number of copies you use, you can come up with optimal number of copies to use and so on and so forth. So it turns out to our delight as um, theory guys that the encounter times have exponential tails. Exponential tails mean, means they kind of their tails follow the exponential distribution. And since we have multiple copies to work with, this means that we can really work with minimum of exponentials, which is a very, very simple thing in probability, and it just makes your life significantly simpler, let me put it this way, uh, when you do the analysis. Um, if we use your uh, simulator and it turns out that the tails are not exponential, this is not good news. We'll just hide the result and don't talk about this. <laughs> but they are exponential. We have used real traces. Only the tails, though, not the whole, not the whole uh, distribution. Now, the, first, uh, the third step has to do with the contention-aware analysis. So basically, to do the first two, we have to ignore the fact that there is all this wireless interference. But then we say, OK, now we need to put this back into the picture, and we need to do a lot of stuff, like take into consideration that there is finite bandwidth. When I meet another car, let's say the other car wants to get a movie that I have. I'm not going to stay within the range of this other car long enough to send a whole movie. Then when it's a matter of scheduling who is going to talk when, interference from distant nodes, it's, it gets into the physical area. I don't think that most of you would appreciate uh, more details on that. So um, we don't need the notations because I assume you don't want to hear details about that, right? It's a valid assumption. Most of the people in the 
Exactly. So let me just move on with, uh, well, this. Now you can see some formulas, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this is some wireless stuff, how the wireless networks work and what are the various um, sources of uh, interference. This is some animation explaining how the analysis works out and how you get the various formulas, uh, more formulas. And I'm going to spend just some time on this one, uh, which says, OK, now we have this framework. We have all these formulas that you have just seen flying around through the slides. How do you use these formulas? For example, we could say, I'm going to use these formulas to choose the number of copies I want to use. Maybe you could say, I want to have a delay that is guaranteed to be within an alpha distance from the optimal delay. So we were able to also compute the optimal delay. How many copies should we use? And these are the formulas you have to use based on all our previous analysis. But what is interesting is this table. If you want to be, let's say, within, I don't know, a factor of two from the optimal, in a scenario where you have 100 nodes, you only need to use about 10 copies, which means flooding would basically use 100 copies. You are using an order of magnitude less copies and you basically are very, very close to the optimal. Um, another uh, interesting question, practical interesting question, is how do you spray all these copies? So this uh, heavily depends on the mobility model. The main two ideas that we came up with is the follow are the following. That um, one idea is you always chop your copies in half. So when you meet another guy, you just keep half of the copies, give the other guy half of the copies. This is basically going to minimize the time that it takes to spray. It's like a binary tree, if you know what I mean. But then, if you take into consideration that some nodes are better than other nodes in delivering these packets to their destination, perhaps you should take this into consideration as well. So in the end, after doing, um, I don't know if you I think guys in planning do a lot of dynamic programming and things like that, some of them at least. So after uh, formulating the problem as a dynamic programming problem, we ended up with a solution that basically says the following. When you have few copies left at your disposal, the best guy should really keep all of them. The best guy meaning the best car. Uh, but if you have a lot, that is at the beginning of the spraying phase, just cut them in half. This turns out to be very, very close to uh, optimal. And uh, I will uh, also speak a little bit about how you do network classification, and then I will open it up for more uh, questions. Um, so why do we need network classification? Well, because different kinds of uh, mobile networks require very different routing protocols. And you have to figure out a way, you as a node, in what environment you are right now, in order to decide which protocol you are going to use. So in general, there are three types of networks that we are interested in. And you can, whenever I say networks, you can think vehicular networks here. You could be in a connected environment in the city center. You could be in an intermittently connected environment, which is what we have been talking up to this point, where every now and then you don't have contemporaneous end to end paths. So you really need to use other cars as relays. <coughs> uh, this may be suburbs. Or you could be in a completely disconnected environment when you are in the middle of nowhere. Okay? In this case, you really need to somehow bring dedicated ferries to bridge gaps between uh, disconnected clusters. So, and you definitely need to know where you are. Uh, for example, if you're in a disconnected network, what's the point of just sending packets all the time and you know, they will go nowhere anyway? Okay, so how do you figure out a way for cars or for nodes to understand where they operate? And you need to do this in a completely decentralized fashion. So nodes will observe the environment around them and they will just make a decision. And clearly we are gonna use all the analysis that we have done before in order to come up with good, uh, simple uh, rules. Uh, so we will define some thresholds. I'm not going to uh, really talk a lot about how you choose the values of these thresholds. It's not very hard. That they have to do with really, when do I say that I'm really connected? Let's say, what's the percentile of nodes that they should be really be within range of each other for me to declare that I'm in a relatively connected network? How much time do I really stay in contact with another node? If you are driving really fast and you just spend, let's say, two seconds with another car, you don't have much time to really exchange many packets. 
just the time to establish connection might be two seconds. Um, this is the T-contact. T-duration, you will see what it is in the next slide. And T-delay is basically how much is the maximum delay that I'm willing to tolerate. If I am in a mobility-assisted routing scenario, you know, if somebody is going to tell me, yeah, you can send your email in the next half hour, I'm going to be fine. But if you are chatting, you know, you cannot wait for half an hour until you get the other person's reply on your chat message. So all these things have to be taken into consideration. So at its time slot, its node does the following thing. It will estimate the number of nodes in the network. I will tell you how later on. And using this with knowledge about the network area, transmission range, and analytical formulas, it will do the following. It will calculate the probability that the network is connected, calculate the optimal expected delay that you would have had if you were to do everything perfectly and you were an oracle that knew the future. And then it would classify the network using the following process. So it's important to understand the um, intuition in this process, not so much the details. So first, you're going to look at the probability that the network is connected that you just calculated. And you're going to say, is it larger than my threshold? If it's less than my threshold, it means that forget about it. I'm not in a connected uh, scenario case. If it's larger than the threshold, and you at least have a neighbor that you can talk to, you'll say, fine. I'm going somewhere here. Let me say that this time slot is connection eligible. I'm going somewhere. Now, if it so happens that a large number of time slots immediately before this time slot were also connection eligible, how large? Well, at least t duration number of time slots. Then I'm going to declare that, yeah, I'm in a connected network at this point. So let me use uh, protocols that they will work well and efficiently in a connected case. Now, if some of the things does not hold. Either we are not very well connected, or yeah, perhaps this particular time slot, I was connected enough, but all, all the previous time slots I weren't. Then you would say, well, OK, I'm not in a connected regime. Can I just check if the expected delays in this network are huge or not? If they are less than a threshold, I'll say, OK, uh, I will assume that I'm in an intermittently connected case. I'm not connected, but I can still reach my destination using mobility-assisted routing within some reasonable time frame. And even if this doesn't hold, then I'm going to just say I'm disconnected, and that's it. OK? That's basically the idea. Um, the practical metric would be, what is the percentile of slots that me, as a node, classify a network in each of these three categories? And note that it's not necessarily the case that all nodes will have exactly the same classification for every time slot. Some cars may think that this is connected. Sometimes they think, no, we are not really connected, and so on and so forth. So let me show you, uh, I'm going to skip these details about how you do these various calculations, more uh, formulas. And I'm going to directly show you simulation results. Where what I'm doing is I'm comparing the distributed algorithm that I just described to a centralized offline oracle-based algorithm. Like what you suggested before, I can run my simulator. I know exactly how the things are going to play out, how the nodes are going to move. And I'm going to just see when I could actually have delivered fast enough a packet to the destination, and so on and so forth. And these are the results. And uh, they are anything interesting results. Look at this uh, plot here. Let me explain what it shows. So here, in the y-axis, I have the percentile of nodes classifying the network in the corresponding type. There are three types of networks. Disconnected, intermittently connected, and connected. You can see the three colors. So here I have a 200 by 200 grid as my space. Uh, my transmission range is 30. I am varying the number of nodes. So here I have very few nodes. And here in the parentheses, I'm showing the connectivity percentile, which I'm reminding you is the percentile of nodes that they belong to the maximum connected cluster. You can think about this. What's the percentile of cars that they are in the city center right now? Uh, so I'm, as I'm going on the right, I have more and more nodes, so I'm getting more and more connected because I don't change my network size, my network area. And as you can see, the more we go to the right, the more we get into the blue area, which is the connected area. The more we are on the left, as expected, the more we are in the disconnected area. And somewhere here in the middle, we are in the intermittently connected area. So for example, in, the, in this column here, where I have 60 nodes, you can see all three colors. This basically means that about 5% of the nodes thought that they live in a connected network. And about 5% of them thought that they live in a disconnected network. But the vast majority of them, 90% of them, thought that they are in the internally connected network. Now, to compare 
quickly how, what the distributed uh, uh, algorithm is doing and what the central as as compared to the centralized algorithm we just do a majority voting rule so for example in this case since most cars think that they are in an intermittently connected network i'm going to just declare this is an intermittently connected network and i'm going to see what the centralized uh, algorithm declares and what the distributed algorithm declares which is as i said significantly significantly simpler it's it is just based on simple um, information gathered locally as opposed to somebody that he's offline oracle based centralized there's no comparison between the two and interestingly enough we pretty much get the same results except from the boundaries boundaries meaning when you really switch from one area to the other area where sometimes you have some small errors but it's not a big deal and uh, this is another uh, um, scenario. It's exactly the same idea. Here I'm just uh, varying the transmission range instead of the number of nodes. And uh, similar things as before. And pretty much this is it. I'm going to just summarize and say that I've talked quickly about how to design efficient uh, routing schemes uh, to deal with multi-hopping and uh, intermittent connectivity. How to perform, uh, well, I really went fast with this. How to perform performance, uh, realistic performance analysis and use it to optimize protocols. How to design distributed methods to classify the network based on connectivity characteristics. This was the last part. Um, ongoing work, some of it is future, most of it is ongoing work. One thing is we want to customize uh, protocols for specific VANET applications. We are doing this, but we are doing this together with this last part that I'm going to come up in a second. Transport layer, we want to figure out how to do fundamental transport layer uh, operations given the intermittent <coughs> connected uh, nature of the network. Uh, with respect to network characterization, I told you how we characterize the network, but the next step is to use this to choose protocols. So I want to... Um, exactly say how we'll choose protocol A versus protocol B depending on what the vehicle decides. Am I well connected or not well connected? And last, and that's also a project that I am undertaking with Cisco. Cisco is the, large, the largest networking company. Um, they are trying to build something like what I just uh, uh, described up in the Bay Area um, in San Mateo. They have some discussions with the city there as well. So they're trying to build a box that is going to have all the technologies I, I discussed about. And you basically have to integrate all these different technologies. And it is in specific applications like this one that I believe it makes sense to customize protocols for specific applications. Because if you have a real system that you will deploy, then it makes sense to start thinking, yeah, if I want to have, let's say, accident prevention or... Um, entertainment applications or whatever, I'm going to customize my system for that because now we're talking about a specific application. Uh, selected publications, well, whatever. I think you just go to my research website or my own website, just type my last name and you will find them. Uh, and that's it. Well. <laughs> I guess it's more interesting. Thanks. found that the uh, the flooding, the delays in the flooding were significantly higher than in in your method. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how much of that is sensitive to the capacity of the of the nodes of being so say they invent some technology and they're able to cut down the number of um, I forget what you call them, but the yeah. number of so, um, how how would that change the results? So the main problem is not the capacity, but is the interference. So, so what you're saying, uh, it's, it's a good, you, you have a good point, but the main problem is not necessarily that I don't have enough time to send you the packets I want, and perhaps I need to carefully select what I'm going to send you first. Meaning if I were to do flooding, I would have gazillion packets to send to you. But it is the fact that if everybody is sending a gazillion packets to everybody else, even if I have a huge capacity, there is so much interference created on the network that I'm going to be doomed. So... If you use, as I said before, the very expensive radius and you can cut down on interference, then yeah, you might as well use flooding. Maybe, you know, the cost of this super cool radius is going to go down in you know, 10 years. I don't know, 20 or whatever. But there are some fundamental limits, physical, uh, natural fundamental limits. So I don't think this is going to happen. Yes? Yes, yeah, so in um, spray and focus, uh, you're saying that uh, uh, spraying or is done 
uh, on the basis of some formula which reduces the total uh, expected delay. Yeah, uh, you could or say minimizes that. the expected delay. I mean, I'm not uh, uh, always doing it that uh, rigorously, but yes. Yeah. But, but does that necessarily mean that uh, uh, the source has to have complete information on the location of the, of the, of okay. the destination? So, good point. The answer is no. The, oh, everything is probabilistic. So the way these things work is that the source has a probabilistic view of the network and not a deterministic view. It has no idea about exactly where the, the, the destination is. It just has some metrics dictating how good the various nodes that, they are, that, that the source meets, uh, how likely they are in meeting the destination fast enough, or how likely they are in moving the packets towards where the destination is going as well. For example, if you consider of uh, scenarios where if you knew who your neighbor is, say, so you know that everybody's going back to their home around 5 p.m., then, I'm just, you know, just imagine this scenario, it would make perfect sense to, I don't know, maybe give some packets to this guy if you want them to be delivered at your place, right? But, but then the information of the destination of delivery has to be there. Yeah, but it is there. Whenever you have a packet in networking, mm -hmm. you have the destination address always. You say, I'm sending this and I want it to go there. So then you have all these guys around you and you say, I want this guy to go there. Give me your information for me to decide how good you are in delivering this guy there. And as I said, it's a probabilistic decision. It's not that you know exactly what's going to happen. But, but how about the car that you said it, uh, that has encountered an accident? In, in well, in this case, things are even simpler because you easily know what's the direction of movement. All pretty much all of the cars have this information. So all you're going to do is that you're going to just send the packets to the guys that are going the other direction. So the, 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 the guys that they are involved in the accident, they will send the packet and the guys that they are going on the other direction on the highway will receive it. They will be perceived as, as next relays for this transmission. And as these guys are going on the other direction, they will inform again of the guys that are going in the other direction. So essentially, if you think about it, you always send the packet. So a good relay in this case is somebody that is traveling in the other direction than you are. That's the route. All you need to know is which direction you are going and which direction the other guy is going. But what his question may be in that case, what is the destination? Ah, you just look. Right. Yeah. So the destination in this case is to inform people around you. So yeah. now this Long is called. Destination. So there are three ways of doing this. So there is um, when you do routing in networking, you can either have a single destination or you can have a group of uh, a number of this of of of, of nodes, destination nodes, or you want to broadcast it to everybody. So in, in many of the applications in Vanets, you have a number of destinations. It's not everybody, but it's not just one guy either. And this is a good point. Last question? Yes. Uh, for the centralized and distributed, you showed the differences. Uh -huh. So do you have like, uh, I mean, those were like differ uh, differences you showed by simulations, the numbers that mm -hmm. is doing better? So if I have theory. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, what's the question? Yeah, so did you have, like, uh, compute the theoretical, like... No, bounds, I don't have oh, bounds. Okay. Because the distributed algorithm is really a heuristic-based algorithm. So I'm just running the simulations, and I'm just looking at the results. Okay. Um, we're just about at 1.30, and we have to bring back all these chairs. So <laughs> let's give our uh, speaker another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.